Today, we discuss how quant funds can fit in your portfolio, and Pfizer is down big post the vaccine rollout. Can it recover? Let's find out. This is Invest Talk, independent thinking, shared success. Good afternoon, fellow investors, and welcome back to Invest Talk. This is our Tuesday, July 9th, 2024 edition, and we are well into the third quarter now, and things are heating up both around us due to the weather and in markets. And the big question is, how do you handle the the latter? Uh, I can't help you with the former. Hopefully you have some air conditioning. Uh, but uh, our job here is to help you navigate these times uh, with a level head. Not chasing the latest fad. Not getting out over your skis and risk. But developing a plan and executing on that plan consistently and then adjusting when needed, but knowing when to adjust, not uh, just because you're, you talk to your cousin or you talk to somebody at a, at a, uh, at a barbecue over the weekend or a coworker. Those are typically poor places to find good investment advice because typically by the time they're telling you about it, They've gotten in and same with all their friends. And so this isn't about the next hot stock tip. I'm not banging big buttons like Kramer. This isn't, uh, we were not here for entertainment, although hopefully you're entertained by me a little bit. It's here for education. That's what this show is here for. To educate you by giving you actionable material and up-to-date relevant data, as well as answering your finance and investment questions. Because I can sit here and bloviate uh, about whatever is on my mind, but that's not nearly as important as what's on your mind. So that's why we always encourage you to call in because this is that's what the show is about. Getting to the answers that trouble you, that... Uh, prevents you from taking that action, the correct action, the down-to-earth action, not the emotional action. Okay. Now, in a bit, we will talk about today's market performance, run down the show topics, as well as answer your questions, and we're going to tackle the first one right now. Hi, Justin. Hi, Luke. I had a question. I own ConocoPhillips, C-O-P. Uh, I have it in two lots, one at 78 dollars per share and the other one about 108 i'm up like 25 percent or so and it's kind of been just kind of staying in a small range a couple percent here and there should i take profits or should i just do you think the energy sector will continue to grow thanks for your advice all right looking at conoco phillips this is a name that we've owned for a while as well and it's one of our favorite large cap Maybe call it mega cap, $130 billion market cap. Yeah, anything over $100 billion, I kind of call mega. But it's obviously a very large company and well diversified across the world. Operating all of the 48 lower, uh, the lower 48 states in the US, as well as Alaska and Norway and several countries in Asia and the Middle East. So, like I said, globally diversified. And we like the just strong balance sheet, only about a $13 billion in net debt on $130 billion market cap. Very clean balance sheet there. Free cash flow, $8.2 billion. Now that has come down from 18, but it's leveling out here around $8 billion. And we like, <clears throat> we, we like that level of cash and the ability to pay that dividend right around 3.5%. So, you know, it's been in a consolidation period, just like the oil patch has since the Ukraine war, you know, it spiked during the Ukraine war and it's gone through, like I said, just a consolidation period trading at only about five and a half times enterprise value to EBITDA looking forward. And, you know, historically that's a pretty low level, uh, for ConocoPhillips. So, uh, we like the profitability. We like the cash flow, We like the balance sheet and the diversity of assets across the world. So, uh, we're going to continue to give ConocoPhillips a thumbs up. So I would keep holding. 
Thanks for the call. Let's go to Sid in North Carolina looking at Qualcomm. Hi, Justin. Good evening. Thank you for your time and taking the call. Of course. Uh, this is in my radar, and I do have a small portion which I picked up at around 120, 130 price range, but very uh, small percentage, even less than half percent of my portfolio. Mm-hmm. But uh, it's going great, uh, and I'm not sure if I have to add more or should I just hold it now because the price has gone up drastically from 120 to 200 and 10 changes so mm-hmm. what is your take on that and uh, and what is the next entry point if at all there is any in, in the near future thank you for your input no problem now it, 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 this is another name that we own for clients it's up uh, nicely from a low last october around 109 now it's at 207 so obviously a big big move as of late and it obviously caught up to a lot of its valuation but the qu- big question as you said, is, is it gone too far, too fast, and, and should you sell? And I think a simple answer is no. I, I think it's it's become about fairly valued now uh, after being drastically undervalued uh, roughly a year ago. And you know, it's supposed to earn $11.33 next year on a $207 stock, still growing uh, its earnings in the mid-teens. We think that's a reasonable uh, multiple to trade at right, in the high teens uh, going forward. And it's a it's obviously a great business. Now they they need to really capitalize on their uh, Snapdragon processors and expanding the use of those into personal computers, et cetera, which they do have. But you know their market share is fairly low. Uh, so there, there's some growth to be had on that front, uh, but certainly some risk. And their, their brand, bread and butter, though has to do with you know the chips that go into phones, uh, 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 all types of phones, uh, iPhones, Androids, et cetera. And with the new AI craze, you see that with the latest Apple release, which I don't think will happen, you know, we'll create an upgrade cycle this year. Uh, but next year, I do think that there will be enough runway for Apple to expand the products, to uh, expand the, the capability, shall we say, of their AI product, and that would drive an upshift uh, in the in sales, and obviously that would hit Qualcomm's bottom line. So, uh, you know that next phase of growth is probably a little ways out, and that's why I think you're probably going to get a consolidation period here. I don't think it's going to drop dramatically. I also don't think it's going to uh, it's going to have our time really moving up dramatically. I think in the near near term on this name, uh, a lot of it has to do with it's overbought on the weekly chart. And but the momentum is good, the business is good. It's now roughly fairly valued, uh, but the next catalyst, like I said, probably is until next year. So I would be kind of accumulating on dips, uh, but I don't think you're going to be going to get a big dip uh, over the next twelve months. Probably more of a consolidation period. Thanks for the call. Now we're going into a short break, and on the other side, I will run down today's plan topics and talk about today's market activity. Please remember, you can call anytime and leave your question on the Invest Talk Voice Bank. And if you're listening via our live stream on AM 1220 in the Silicon Valley area, you can call right now at 888 chart Everybody wants a secure financial future, but getting there takes strategy, discipline, and the right information. Welcome to the Invest Talk Podcast. Is something on your mind? You can call us 24-7 at 888-99-CHART with all of your finance and investment questions. Now we have a lot of ground to cover over the next 40 minutes and here's what I have planned. Now, our main focus point is about quant funds and can they steady your portfolio in volatile markets? Now, it can be unclear whether quant funds can be effectively diversifying a portfolio and generating enough income to warrant the 
you know, the, the over, over long term, you know, really lower returns. But sometimes it's not just about raw returns, it's risk adjusted returns. And can a quant fund improve the risk adjusted returns of a portfolio? So we will touch on that. Also, I have other topics on the docket. One is the national debt. And, you know, there's a new analyst coming out, you know, continue to warn about uh, the debt. And I think the end result will be a change in Fed policy, which we will get to and discuss kind of what that means for the dollar, for um, hard assets uh, and just the different sectors within the economy. Also, Roth IRAs. These are becoming increasingly more important in the retirement planning uh, space to try to get money into accounts that can grow tax deferred and you can take the money out without any penalty uh, and without paying the tax. And there are different ways to get money into a Roth IRA because there is there are limitations and, and you need to be aware of those. So we're going to, to touch on that. And then lastly, the Schwab Trading Activity Index, basically tracking how the average investor is been positioning themselves in the month of June. So we will look at that report as well if we have time. But we will get to your voice bank questions first. Investment, investing for aging parents is one that we will play, as well as get to some questions submitted via the comment section over on our YouTube channel. And of course, we welcome your live calls on anything finance or investment related. We'd love to hear from you. 8 at 8 99 chart is how you get through and ask your question on today's show. Now, let's take a quick look at the markets today. Uh, it was a bit of a, a mixed bag. Uh, you really had the best part of the market on the value side. Value mid, mid and large cap value up slightly. Mid and small cap growth down fairly decently. Uh, small cap growth down three quarters of 1%. You had Sirius XM Holdings down about 12.4%. And let me see, I think the big losers, Zim Holdings, Wheels Up. But yeah, a lot of those small mid cap tech names uh, certainly struggled. Uh, and that was likely on the back of higher rates. Okay, you saw rates uh, tick up a little bit uh, today. Uh, what else was of note? Gold prices were up as well, uh, even though the dollar was slightly up. So you continue to see relative strength in the gold market, precious metal market, uh, even if the dollar is up, even if interest rates are up. It's just powering along, and that's certainly uh, a, a hint at what is likely ahead for the precious metal space that the relative strength continues to uh, improve and uh, power higher. And I think that is uh, the main story right now as we head into a period which I don't think there's a lot uh, a lot to do this week. Uh, it's a kind of a quiet week before the earnings season kicks off next week. You have the inflation data. I believe that's on Thursday. That could be a bit of a market mover. You did have a Fed official out. Uh, it actually was... Jerome Powell, if I remember correctly, um, uh, he was testifying in front of Congress about, you know, there needs to be more uh, progress on inflation before they do a rate cut. Uh, but ultimately, I think you're going to you're going to continue to get that. And there likely will be a Fed rate cut in September. The only thing that would push me push against that uh, is basically, are they going to get involved before the election? That's something that I think uh, they will consider. But ultimately, the economy needs a, a bit of a cut here. Um, if they are, and they need to start that, probably weaken the dollar a little bit, really uh, reignite economic growth, uh, which st certainly has stagnated in the first half of this year. And you know, the powers that be, they certainly want a stronger economy. Uh, they don't want a stronger economy going to the election, and they, they certainly don't want to see uh, a major economic calamity. Uh, over the next few months because that will be a death nail to the uh, current administration. So we will uh, we'll move on. Uh, that's how I see the markets right now. And we're going to head into a break still to come in, in this podcast. We'll tackle your voice bank calls and get into the main focus point. So stay with me, but give us a call at 888-99-CHART. In 
enjoyed our insights on Invest Talk? Great news. Our podcast is available on all major platforms. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. Get the latest in investment advice across Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. Subscribe now and join our community of informed investors. Now, our main focus point concerns this question. Can quant funds steady your portfolio in volatile times? Now, quant funds are short for quantitative funds. And if you uh, if you watched our webinar, uh, any one of our webinars recently, you probably, we talk, probably talked about quantitative versus qualitative analysis. Or quantitative is anything to do with numbers. Qualitative are things that are much more difficult to define. You know, what is the strength of leadership team? What is the strength of a brand? What is the uh, regulatory environment? Okay, all those things are more qualitative and it's up to the analyst and up to interpretation. Quantitative funds and quantitative analysis has everything to do with what are the numbers? Now that may, and, and but the numbers can mean a lot of different things, okay? And that means quant funds expose investors to a wide range of assets, industries, and may produce returns that are not as correlated with conventional asset classes like equities and bonds, okay? So the whole goal here of the quant funds is to reduce uh, the emotional impact of investment decisions, which the average investor is really bad at. Most, uh, the average investor is almost entirely driven by their emotions. Now, if you listen to Invest Talk, you know, hopefully we've helped you get rid of some of those habits. But needless to say, not everyone listens to Invest Talk, right? So their emotions continue to drive their decision making process. Now, the average professional is less emotional, but that does not mean that they aren't emotional at all, okay? And a quant fund is really designed to be more systematic to, in order to manage a portfolio, both find opportunities and manage risk, okay? And because they tend to be less correlated, they can be, they can protect during times of market volatility. They can't. They don't always, but they can't. But often, right, they're they're going to diverge from your traditional asset class. So if the S&P is roaring, yeah, your average quant fund probably not going to keep up. So it's not usually a vehicle that you're going to use in order to get the best return over a short period of time. It's there for diversification. For be about being a ballast to the portfolio in times of market stress, and research shows that the correlation between quant and discretionary assets, like an index fund, is pretty low. And so, taken together as part of a a plan, it can have a a good effect to reduce risk, yet still over time, keep the returns very high and very good. So overall, you get a better, like a sharp ratio is one way to measure it. Uh, and and put simply, it's just risk versus reward. Now, a typical quant fund or the most popular quant fun, funds, excuse me, are momentum funds. Because it's not looking at anything about the business. It's just what fun, what what stocks have the best momentum over a certain period of time, right? That have that are up the most over the last twelve months. And during good times, those do very well. But during bad times, they do even worse. So, like twenty twenty two, quant funds did not perform very well. Now, that's the type of quant fund that does have more correlation with the overall market. Because especially because it's uh, the, the indices are market weighted or market cap weighted, 
in many ways, the indices are momentum fun lights. Right, more diversified, but still because of the way they're structured, they're kind of momentum funds. So when you're looking at these type of quant funds, it's really important to delineate what the strategy is. And ideally, it's not just one factor that they are keying in on, like momentum. It's a multi-factor approach from earnings quality. Maybe there's a momentum screen in there as well. Balance sheet. All the things that we talk about, the fact that you have to look at the whole picture. Now, they're only looking at the whole picture when it comes to the numbers. They're ignoring qualitative, which is hard to analyze as, as well. So in certain instances, it can work. But there's still market risk. It doesn't mean you can't lose money in these things. There's still liquidity risk. Some of the times these funds are invested in things that are less liquid, for example. And, you know, it's all up to the algorithm. And humans still build the algorithm. So there's still a model risk here that they don't perform as well as the model had suggested in particular market conditions. So quant funds, they're not necessarily bad. They're not necessarily great. They are a piece of a well-diversified portfolio if you understand the strategy and ideally find ones that have multi-factors in their approach. Now, in the next Invest Talk, we'll look into this story. Nike brought back a retired executive to mend strained relationships with key retailers. So will the return of Nike's former executive boost the stock price? That story tomorrow. But for now, I'm Justin Klein. I'm ready to take your calls at 888 chart Tom from Kentucky, hang on, you will be next. Do you want to... Let's go to Tom in Kentucky looking at Pfizer. Hey, Justin, I own Pfizer in my IRA, and it's time I bought it. I thought I'd taken the vaccine and... I'd done a lot of research, and I thought just the future was bright. And now, you know, I'm down like twelve or twelve dollars a share, and I just I don't see all the news I see now is dismal, and I don't do I just go ahead and eat my loss and go forward, or I'm looking for your advice. Well, I'm not sure what research you did. I've been doing research on Pfizer uh, for a while. Um, I personally was injured by uh, the Pfizer vaccine, and uh, I actually find uh, the research to be quite disturbing uh, about how uh, you know how safe uh, the mRNA vaccines really are. Um, we still don't know what the long term effects are, and so um, I personally, you can give me a million dollars, I wouldn't take a booster. Um, and I think you know the rest of the public feels very similarly because ninety plus percent of people are not taking these boosters uh, because they don't feel comfortable, um, and that's why Pfizer's the earnings continue to head lower last quarter revenues are down 20 percent. earnings are down 33 percent, and i actually think it's uh tarnished their brand uh completely um so i i think you need to move on um i think this is uh this platform is wildly unsafe um and i i frankly don't think it ever should have been rolled out um based on on my research and uh, yeah, I think you need to just uh, take your lumps. It's been a downtrend, and it's been a downtrend for a very, very good reason. Okay, thanks, Joseph. Thanks for the call. Now, I hope you're telling your friends that our Invest Talk audio podcast is also available in video form over on our YouTube channel. Teams now every day, we receive finance and investment questions via the comment section. So let's tackle one right now. Philip Learn Teach says, longtime listener is Hims a little too late to invest in. Hims. And this is uh, a name that certainly has moved pretty far pretty fast. It, back in November, it was trading around five, six dollars per share. It recently had a high of twenty-six dollars per share and came back to around twenty and change. Now, technically, fine. There's nothing wrong uh with the technicals. A uh, nice little healthy pullback. Frankly, it's a little oversold at the current time, but but really hanging in there. Um, now, for everyone else out there, hymns. This is uh, hymns and hers, and it provides healthcare software solutions for health and wellness products in the United States, and it connects 
licensed healthcare professionals to everyday consumers to get things like uh, mental health drugs, sexual health drugs, uh, dermatology uh, products, uh, and, and more. And I know they recently got into Ozempic, I believe, as well, or GLP-1. So uh, I think that's what's really driving this higher was that that entrance there. And, you know, it, it, as part of a, a growth portfolio, I actually don't hate it. You know, it's it's profitable. It has a good balance sheet. Um, let's take a look at its shares outstanding because I know it was increasing that. Yeah, that's my biggest issue is it continues to increase its shares outstanding uh, when it really doesn't need to. Uh, its profitability is poor, but it is improving. Um, so, you know, I, I don't hate it because it has good momentum. The chart looks fine. Uh, I, I do think that ability to get directly to the consumer uh, is something not a lot of companies can do. Uh, now, I think there's definitely some regulatory risk here is, you know, who are these doctors? Is there a crackdown? Think of, uh, I think of the, of the pain management companies around opioids, right? Does the government come in and kind of shut down their process or limit their process? I think that's certainly a risk to look out for. Um, but as a momentum play right now, this recent pullback would be a good entry. But you want to have an out here probably around the 200-day moving average. Now, that is down all around $16 per share. But that's where it found support back in May. And I think that as long as, as, long as it holds that level, that uptrend remains intact. So uh, not bad as a trade, uh, but it is very, very high risk. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on let's touch a bit on Roth IRAs. I think this is becoming a very important tool that investors are going to need to take advantage of, especially if interest not interest rates, tax rates are going to rise over time. Why is that? Because I always say with Roth Roth IRAs, Roth 401ks, let's say Roth accounts. Versus traditional accounts like IRAs or a 401ks. Roth accounts, it's always about how, what is your tax rate when the money goes in? That's, that's all you have to think about. Getting money into a Roth and what am I taxed at? And is that likely to be higher or lower in the future? If it's likely to be higher, well, now is a good time to get it in. Generally. Now, maybe you find an even better time, right? You might be in the 22% tax bracket today, but uh, you might retire next year, have almost ne- no income, no Social Security, you don't take Social Security, and you're at a z- nearly 0% tax rate or a 12% tax rate. And that might be a better time to do Roth conversion. So this is something we actually help our clients with. We have Roth conversion tools to figure out, okay, when they should convert so they can save tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes. And... It's very important to have a plan here because it can be a huge swing factor in retirement. Because you can avoid things like Medicare premiums and a 3.8% surtax on uh, net investment income, for example. But the biggest barrier is actually to get money in is usually income. Now, to contribute to a Roth IRA, for example, if you're single, you have to make less than $146,000. If you're married, filing jointly, you have to make less than $230,000 thousand to make the full contribution. Now, some savers can do backdoor contributions. We help clients with that as well. And I think that's something that can be very, very important. You can even, if your, if your 401k allows, do mega backdoors that can uh, and do that into a Roth uh, option. That can be something to think about, but it's always about your tax rate. Remember, are you in a high tax rate or not? And most of the time, the best way to get money into a four, into a Roth account is through a conversion of some type. You can convert a typically a 401k into a Roth. And remember, you don't have to do this all at once. It can be a little bit here, a little bit there. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to convert my entire account. Even though there are no limits to how much you can convert in a particular year. Remember that all of that amount hits you that year on the taxes. So doing a little at a time, trying to avoid big tax bills is probably the best way to go. But having an eye towards this consistently is pretty important. Now, an employer needs to offer a Roth 401k option, and about 40% of plans do, at least according to Fidelity for Fidelity plans. So roughly 40% of plans offer a Roth 401k option. 
Um, but it's important, once again, to talk to your CPA, figure out the tax effects before you do that, as well as the state tax effects, because that can be big. Is Are you living in a high tax state now? And in the future, are you going to be moving to a low tax state? Maybe you want to wait until you're in that low tax state. That's also something we do for clients building financial plans and figuring out, okay, in retirement, they're going to move to maybe uh, to Florida and, and, and have no state income tax, for example. Okay. And then in-service distributions. So this is something where you're still working. You're contributing to a 401k. Maybe they don't have a Roth option, Roth 401k option. Once you hit 59 and a half, 88% of, of plans allow this. When you hit 59 and a half, you can roll that 401k into either a traditional IRA, no tax consequences, or into a Roth IRA. And once again, it doesn't have to be all. It can be part. Ideally, you probably do, if you don't want to do all of it into a Roth, you do uh, all of it into a traditional IRA and then convert part of that into a Roth each year. That's something, once again, we help clients with all the time. So something you should be thinking about as well. And then... A new tool, which is called a solo, a Roth solo 401k. And we have clients with lots of solo 401ks. Uh, We actually don't have anyone that's set up with these new uh, Roth solo 401ks. And if you are a business owner, even if if it's your main thing or it's a side gig, you can put in up to $76,500 up to, you know, there's some, some rules around that, but that's a lot of money to put into solo 401k or a Roth solo 401k. Since January, Charles Schwab is now offering Roth solo 401ks. Fidelity is going to offer them in 2026, and that's when the law will require it. So that's a new tool as well. We haven't implemented it, like I said, for any of our clients, but at least we know we can. We do use Schwab. So um, you definitely need to be thinking about this. This should be part of everyone's thought processes of, How do I get money from my 401k into a Roth IRA consistently at relatively advantageous tax rates? And for everyone, that's going to be different based on their age, when they plan to retire, what their income is today versus the future, what are their total assets in a tax deferred account like an IRA or 401k, et cetera. So uh, you certainly want to think about that. And if you need help, reach out. Now, let's keep things moving and circle back to the Best Talk Voice Bank for a listener that came in earlier. Hi, I'm Lincoln Justin. I have a question regarding taking over our parents' assets. I've recently taken over my parents who are in the mid to upper 80s finances and was wanted to get your thoughts with regards to purchasing 100% into bonds and treasuries at 5% for a duration of 10 plus years. They really want just the stability, fixed income, and no volatility type situation. Yields at about 5% now. Could be a, a good time to just lock everything in for them. So I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Don't care about growth. Just care about you know them getting some uh, stable income to live out the rest of the years. Don't know if that duration period is too long or too short, but really I'm looking for a, a set and forget situation for them. So what would you guys do? Thanks. Well, here's the issue with you saying 10 plus years. That's duration risk. So they're going to see, so you go buy a, a 10 year treasury bond. Okay. And right now you're, let's look up the, the 10 year. PNX. Oh, my system. Oh, that's why. PNX. There we go. So the 10 year right now is at 4.3%. Uh, let's say you buy that, right? You 4.3%, that's fine for, for you and your parents. Uh, that bond is going to fluctuate consistently over that 10 years. Now you get the coupon, okay? But that is, uh, that's taking duration risk, okay? Now, if you're a believer that inflation is going to stay sticky high, like like we do, that then, then you probably don't want to take that much duration risk. You want to keep uh, your duration relatively short. Probably a laddered bond is probably more appropriate because you never know how much duration you should take exactly. But if you ladder them out in individual bonds, then 
you can be choosier when you need the money, right? Which ones you sell and which ones you hold on to. And so I think that's a better approach than just buying 10 plus year uh, bonds because you are going to limit your duration. And one of the big risks, everyone has an eye, everyone has, I keep saying PTSD from 08. And that prevents them from seeing the other side, what do we call the right tail, okay? When you look at a distribution of outcomes, think of the big, you know, in stats class, uh, very low on each side, and you have the big mound in the middle, okay? And most of the outcomes are in the middle, right? But 08 was on the left side, right? And so when people view outcomes, they think, okay, you're, you generally have these, these middling outcomes, then I'm scared of that big left tail risk, okay? But what about the right tail? Well, things go up a lot. When inflation goes up a lot, right? 2022 was kind of that period where, hey, inflation went up a lot more uncomfortably than most people really want, including a retiree. And duration risk was not what you wanted. Because if you look at, for example, the IEF, the 10-year treasury bond, it went from, I'll look at uh, the ETF, it went from 122 all the way to a low of 90. I don't call that low risk at all. Nearly a 30% drop in the value of those bonds. So can that happen again? Can the 10-year go from mid fours to mid sevens? I don't see why it can't. I don't see why it can't. So... I would go with a laddered bond approach. Still produce that income, but hedge against major increases in the overall uh, overall inflation and overall interest rates. Thanks for the call. There's another question from the Invest Talk YouTube channel. Neofi Tess, I, I can't even say the name, uh, says, interesting video. Also have some curiosity about a handful of Liberty media positions he's built as well. He's saying about talking about Liberty Media held by Buffett. And this is a definitely an interesting case here because, and I don't know much about him, about Warren Buffett uh, buying Liberty Media. I know that it looks like there's a, basically a, a media conglomerate between Sirius XM, uh, you have Formula One, and you also have, I believe, the Braves, the Atlanta Braves. Here's my issue. I like Formula One. I don't love Sirius XM. I don't love the Braves. Why? Well, I think uh, baseball is not the hottest sport right now. I think it continues to, I think it will continue to fade in its uh, popularity slowly. Um, and Sirius has a lot of other issues with competitiveness from, you know, uh, Spotify and, and uh, you know, online uh, streaming rights and formula one i think has some growth there but i rather you can buy f wonk and and get exposure there so we're heading to a break give me a call now at 888-99 chart love today's invest talk episode we want to hear from you drop your investing questions in the comments below and your question could be the star of our next segment Subscribe and stay tuned to see if your question gets answered by Luke and I. Dive into the comments now and become a part of our next conversation. Hi, this is Duncan from New York. Thank you for all that you do. I'm just calling uh, and I'll probably make a couple more phone calls. I have a couple of questions about some stocks, but the first stock ticker I have is QS Quantum Scape Corp. It is a lithium or solid battery electric vehicle company. It's only about 1.8% of my portfolio right now. I know this is a very risky stock, but I just wanted to see what your two cents were, uh, fundamental analysis. Uh, I, I think they don't like make money right now, but just wanted your two cents as a risk play. I'm just only like dollar cost averaging into it, like very little, probably like five bucks every month or something like that. But looking forward to your answer and have a great day. Bye. 
Well, I like the way you're trying to get into it, but you have to really have belief in the technology. And uh, I think you misstated what they do. They are in the solid state battery space, but and that would be used for electric vehicles, but they don't make electric vehicles, right? They would go into these electric vehicles. And, you know, they've sent these to a lot of the major vehicle manufacturers. Uh, and, you know, it's just not economically viable. And that's really the issue here. Uh, you know, it's one thing to come up with new technology. And I always look at like graphene. If you ever go look at graphene, this crazy mineral or a crazy um, uh, material. There we go. Crazy material <laughs> that is, they, they invented a long time ago. But it's extremely expensive to produce and, and integrate into an actual product. And so it's just not economically viable to produce. And that's really what most people miss with these new pieces of technology is what is the use case and can you turn it into a product that's better than what is out here right now for a similar price? That's the big question. And so far, QuantumScape has not been able to do that. It's all been hype. And so, as you said, you can answer a question. They don't make money. They just continue to issue shares. Free cash flow, negative 300 million, trailing 12 months. $2.6 billion market cap still, even though it's near, near its all-time low. So I would not be owning this until there's, unless you have a lot of faith in their ability to turn this technology into something that is economically viable. Okay. Thanks for the call. Now let's touch a bit on the national debt. Oh, fun, right? Uh, just... We all know the national debt is spiraling out of control. But, you know, that's easy to be doom and gloom about it. And I think in the long run, you know, there are major issues. There are. Probably similar to what Japan's dealing with today, right? Their currency is in a free fall, but currency is always relative. Relative to what, right? Well, the value of gold and yen is skyrocketing okay and so i think that ultimately is the path for really the dollar you know can look strong but look at gold today gold prices continue to go up even though the dollar is going up why because while the dollar is going up in relation to other currencies in relation to a lot of hard assets especially scarce hard assets the dollar is going down Because if you believe that gold is a currency, which I do, then gold is the best performing currency. And if you look at things like the study by the Committee for Responsible Federal Budget, found that during Trump's presidency, the government issued $8.4 trillion of new 10-year borrowing. Under Biden, $4.3 trillion. And expect it going forward, $22 trillion more between now and 2034. Ballooning the federal debt from 99% of GDP to 122%. And so that's ultimately the release valve here. Is that a just reckless government, no matter what side of the aisle you're on is likely to mean harder assets will go up over, let's say, bits in the sky. Okay, so that's ultimately the manifestation of a deficit that continues to be out of control. No, I'm Justin Klein. This completes another Invest Talk program. We thank you for listening, and we encourage you to tell your friends and family about our free podcast downloads, which you can find anytime at iTunes, Spotify, or Google Play. And be sure to rate and review on iTunes as well. And check us out in video form over on our YouTube channel. Just search Invest Talk with two T's. Independent thinking, shared success. This is Invest Talk. Good night.
Hey everyone, if you enjoyed this video and wanna see more amazing content, make sure you hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications. Your support means the world to us and helps us create more videos that you love. Subscribe now and join our community of savvy investors.